here to talk about Calvin and the Radical Reformation. Now, for those of you that have never studied Reformation history, the Radical Reformation is really um, something that is, uh, is a term that's used for the Anabaptist and maybe even more radical forms of the Reformation. Dr. Thigpen did a wonderful job in describing for you the unintended consequences of what happened in Luther's Reformation. But to give you an example of that, which we will focus on more next year when we talk about the English Reformation, if you go to, the, say, to the year 1650, which is right around the beginning of the, what's called the, the Puritan Commonwealth in England, by that time, a hundred or so years after the beginning of the Reformation, you find hundreds, literally hundreds, of break-off groups all claiming on the basis of sola scriptura to know the true Christian faith. And so the effects of the Reformation were, were just multifarious and, and mostly divisive. But I've decided today that in order to help you to understand the importance of John Calvin, that I'm not going to be able to discuss the Radical Reformation. That's a whole other subject that some is Reformation historians focus their entire life on. Today what I want to do is to try to help you to understand this man named John Calvin and what his part in the Reformation had to do. To focus upon that, however, is not arbitrary and not limited because I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that John Calvin might have been even more influential than Luther. Much of what took place in the formation of the North American continent, especially in America, since the early days of the colony, was animated by a Calvinist theology. Many of the founding institutions of this country were founded by, or at least populated by Calvinists. And still today, you see that influence, for example, at Princeton University. Although it has been secularized, although it has been changed in many ways, the founding of the College of New Jersey, as it was called, in the early 19th century was by Calvinists. Princeton Theological Seminary in the entirety of the 19th century and up into the first two decades of the 20th century was a Calvinist institution. Whether it is today, well, I'll leave you to judge that. So where does this all begin? It all begins in the year 1509. Because John Calvin, or his name was pronounced in his native French, Jean Calvin, was born in Noyon, France, in the 10th of July in 1509. Calvin was sent by his father to the University of Paris to study for the priesthood. But quickly Calvin decided that he really needed to study law and so he changed his studies and moved to the University of Orléans and Bruges. But Calvin soon returned to Paris and came under the influence of a man named Jacques Lefebvre d'État or, as his name was known in Latin, Faber Stabilensis. Jacques Lefebvre had for a long time been influencing many people in France to uh, try to reform the church in various ways. One of the central messages of Lefebvre's preaching and teaching was that the people needed to get back to the simple gospel and that the church had become too elaborate with its rituals and its sacramental system in a way that obscured the simplicity of the gospel of Christ. Now, he wasn't the first person to preach that. In some ways, the early Franciscan message could be seen in that light, although where they were to take that message later on was in very different directions. In 1533, when Calvin was in Paris, the authorities, both ecclesiastical and civil, decided that, he, that, that there should be some type of a, a clampdown, a suppressing of the Protestant sentiments that were abroad in the city of Paris. Calvin decided that things were getting a little too hot, and so he went moved to Basel, Switzerland, closer to his native country. In Basel, he spent three years studying theology on his own. And he wrote what was to become the most 
significant statement, one of the most significant statements of the Protestant Reformation. The Institutes of the Christian Religion, as it was published in 1536, made a name for Calvin among the Protestant leaders in Europe, and many people began to seek after him. One day, late in the year 1536, Calvin was spending the night in Geneva, Switzerland. A strong Protestant leader in the city there learned of his presence and sought him out to try to persuade him to stay in Geneva and to further the cause of the Reformation. That man's name was Guillaume Ferrel, or William Farrell. Farrell prevailed upon Calvin to try to get him to join him in the cause of the Reformation. Apparently, Geneva, unlike some other cities in Switzerland, was not a place where the Reformation had sunk very deeply. There was widespread immorality within the city, and church attendance was nothing to brag about. But more importantly, Calvin Farrell was having trouble convincing the city council of Geneva to support the beliefs and practices of those who had departed from the Catholic Church. Now, I'm not sure if this was because some of them were Catholic at heart or if they were simply pragmatists and wanted to keep things moving and working as long, and you could believe whatever confession you wanted, as long as you did not create any kind of civil unrest. But in any case, Farrell was trying to get the city council to grant to the ministers of the city the right of excommunication over their parishioners. All we know is that they flatly refused. They wanted everything in the city under their control, including its religious life. This conflict between William Farrell and the city council of Geneva caused Farrell to go to Calvin. Since he had read his Institutes of the Christian Religion, he realized that Calvin may be his greatest ally in trying to convince the city council to reform the church within Geneva. And so he went. And he asked Calvin, will you join us here? Stay here in Geneva with us. Calvin flatly refused. Because Calvin, being of a quiet and scholarly disposition, wanted to find an out-of-the-way place where he could lead the quiet life of a scholar away from the distractions of public life. But as the standard story goes, Farrell became quite indignant with Calvin and began to threaten him with divine judgment. As Kelvin tells the story, Farrell told him that God would judge him severely if in, his, in this hour of need he preferred his own welfare and happiness over the call of the gospel ministry and the spiritual needs of the Genevan people. Calvin, again, as he tells the story, felt as if God was speaking to him and threatening him to with eternal damnation. And so he became convinced that God was indeed calling him to remain in the city and to, to further the cause of the gospel as he understood it. And so in 1536, John Calvin took up his permanent residence in the city and became easily the most articulate spokesman and pastor among the Protestant clergy. But from the very beginning, from the very beginning, Calvin faced the same opposition from the city council that Farrell had experienced as well. He had to fight tooth and nail every day for steps of progress in the affairs of the church within the city. And so as this battle went back and forth between the ministers of the city, led now by Calvin, and the city council, it came to a head three years later. And in 1539, the city council of Geneva expelled Farrell and Calvin from the city. Calvin sought refuge in the German-speaking city of Strasbourg, which today is in eastern France, where he became the pastor of a French-speaking congregation. 
Now, that brings us to the moment in history that I want to focus on to, for us to understand. The year 1539 is very significant in the Protestant Reformation because it was in that year that the question of church reform between the Catholics and the Calvinists came to a head. And like Calvin and all Renaissance humanists, of which he was one, Catholic and Protestant, it didn't matter. They were all trained in the humanist tradition. That's not secular humanism in the modern sense, but Christian humanism as it was practiced in the Renaissance. Like all of them, I will try to follow their motto, brevitas et claritas, brevity and clarity. So I'll try to get right to the point and help you to understand this issue. Because my motivation here today is to inform to inform you about what happened during the Protestant Reformation with regard to Calvinists. But, as I reflect upon it, I think I have a deeper motivation as well. Having been a Calvinist officially for 44 years, I have a deep longing and yearning in my heart to see my very fine Christian brothers and sisters find the fullness of the Christian faith. I want them to experience what I have experienced, what I have come to know, the sacraments of which I knew very little in truth during those years, the sense of the beauty of the magisterial guidance from the leaders, the bishops, and ultimately the Holy Father from the church. There are many good-hearted Christian people today out there in America who are self-conscious Calvinists, but many of them simply do not know. They do not understand the nature of the Catholic Church, and my deep desire is for them to see that. In that year, 1539, Calvin then was living in Strasbourg, away from Geneva, and so there was an Italian cardinal, Giacobbe Sarleto, in northern Italy, who took this opportunity to write a lengthy letter to the city fathers of Geneva and to urge them to return to Mother Church. Cardinal Sarleto argued that the reformers were schismatic and that they had forsaken the teachings of the ancient faith. Calvin, even though undoubtedly he was alienated emotionally from the city of Geneva, nevertheless could not let this letter pass. And the city council of Geneva sent the letter to Calvin, the very man they had banned, and asked him if he would reply to this letter. Because even though they weren't particularly fond of Calvin, they even hated Sadleto more. And they were not, they were not going for a moment to consider returning under that Roman yoke, as they called it. Calvin reflected. He thought. And he said to himself, I need to put aside my personal feelings for the cause of the gospel. Because he perceived Cardinal Sadaletto's letter to the Genevans as being, in fact, an assault upon the gospel. And so, he picked up his pen and he replied. He agreed with the Cardinal that leaving the One Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church was reprehensible, but he also argued that it was not they, the Protestants, who had done that, but that it was the Catholics who had done that, or the Romanists, as he called them. They believed, or Calvin believed, and the Protestants in general in Geneva and in Switzerland believed, that they were only reviving and reaffirming what the Holy Fathers of the ancient church had taught. On each theological issue that was raised in the letter, Calvin says, quote, all we have attempted has been to renew the ancient form of the church. Now it would be extremely valuable for us to look at Calvin's letter to understand what animated this kind of thinking. It states clearly his grievances with the Catholic Church. But his main grievance was that the Roman Church, or the Roman Party, as he called it, 
had forsaken the teachings of ancient Christianity, primarily expressed by the apostles, but also preserved in the early centuries of Christianity. Calvin's goal was renovatio, or renewing the church, by bringing it back to its historical roots. In the Institutes of the Christian Religion, which knew numerous editions between 1536 and its final edition in 1559, Calvin repeatedly sought to answer the charge of the Catholics that the Protestants were introducing novel doctrines. This did not sit well with Calvin, nor with most humanists, because the humanist movement that began in the 15th century, under, for example, Marsilius Ficino in Florence, and that made its way to the northern part of, of Europe, the humanist movement was an idea of returning what they called to ad fontes, back to the fount, back to the fonts of antiquity. It was a revival of ancient Greek and Roman uh, literature, and Calvin was a consummate Latinist. But that same idea was animating the humanist and the Protestants to go back to the Bible as the source of all true Christian teaching. Well, consistent with this desire to be in tune with Calvin's, with Christian antiquity, Calvin almost never uses the words Catholic Church to refer to that ecclesial body of which the Pope is the head. So far as I can tell, Calvin always speaks of it as the Roman Pontiff and his factions, or simply the Roman Church, or the tyranny of the papacy. He reserves the term Catholic Church for the people of God throughout every age who follow the scriptures and administer their sacraments rightly. And of course, rightly means in his own understanding of what the scriptures teach and how the minister sacraments should be administered. In the Institutes of the Christian Religion, Calvin quotes St. Cyprian, the third century bishop of Carthage, to say that outside the Catholic Church, no one can be saved, because it is the mother of all believers. And with approval and pride, Calvin quotes Cyprian again. He cannot have God as his father, who does not have the church as his mother. But, however, on the other hand, just as Calvin is sure that everyone must be a member of the Catholic Church to be saved, he is just as sure that the Roman Church and its serfs, a term he uses for bishops and priests, is not that ancient Catholic Church. He speaks of the Roman Church as accepting and fostering all kinds of falsehoods and abominations in the name of Christ. And so, for example, from the very first edition of the Institutes in 1536, Calvin categorizes all the sacraments except baptism and the Lord's Supper, or the Eucharist, as false sacraments. So, if Calvin wanted to reform the church, what was his method? This is where the letter of Satellito and Calvin's response to that letter becomes important because it shows us the concept of reform that, w that they differed on. It shows us how different visions of reform were ex were exist or existed during the 16th century. And I think you can see immediately the relevance of it today. How many of you, as faithful Catholic lay people and clergy fathers, would believe that the church today needs some reform? I don't see all your hands. You mean you don't think the church needs reform? Of course it needs reform. But how much agreement is there among us or among the church at large about the ways to go about that reform? My brother Marcus Grodi outlined last night some of the different ways that people think it should be reformed. 
Those same, that same diversity of vision about how to reform the church existed within the 16th century. And there were cardinals and bishops within the church at the time who never left the church, who had different visions about how that should be done. So what was Calvin's and how did it differ from Sadletto's, and I might say more broadly, at least a large contingent within the Catholic Church. As I have said, and now in other words, Calvin says, all that we have attempted to do is to restore the native purity from which the sacraments had degenerated, and so will to enable them to restore, to resume their former dignity. And, have, and with regard to the discipline and doctrine of the Genevan Church, Calvin says, we do not hesitate to appeal to the ancient church. What Calvin argues throughout this letter is that it was not the Protestants who abandoned the Catholic Church, but it was the Roman Church that did so. With its tyrannical system of groveling obeisance to the Pope, its elaborate rituals that have obscured the simplicity of the gospel and the sacraments, and its perversion of the teaching of the early fathers. So, Calvin believed that one of the greatest faults of the Catholic Church was the abandonment of the scriptures as the final appeal in the matters of religion. And so, Catholic, and so uh, Calvin thought that like other reformers, the scriptures should ultimately be the source from which we drive true Christian belief. And he believed that that true Christian belief was more or less preserved in the early centuries of Christianity. And so true reform must be a return with continuity to the church fathers. Now let's ask the question, why did Calvin think this? I think the answer is because of the culture in which he grew up. He grew up in a Catholic culture and under a Catholic education which believed that there must be continuity with the past in order to reform the present. His humanist and his Christian training would simply not allow him to dismiss the church fathers as if they had no relevance to the present. And so, the question is not whether we believe the scriptures or the church fathers, but which church, which faith, and which order represents the ancient Catholic faith? Is it the Calvinist belief and order, or is it the Roman, or what we would call the Catholic Church? In the 16th century, to many people, the answer was not so clear. Many people of sincere faith were on different sides of that question. But, in order to understand Calvin even more deeply, we must turn, first of all, to Cardinal Sadoletto's letter to the Genevans. Now, it's interesting, because I can't remember when I went to a Calvinist seminary whether we ever read Cardinal Sadoletto's letter. I can't ever remember reading it. I may have been assigned and just didn't read it. But, but nevertheless, one can understand that in a Calvinist seminary, one is not particularly interested in Sadletto's letter, but we did read very assiduously Calvin's answer to, Calvin, to Sadletto to understand the nature of the Reformation argument. Now, many years later, I have gone back and I have read and translated the letter. And I have looked to see what Cardinal Sadoletto said that made Calvin say what he said in his letters. Here's what I find. I'm going to share four things with you. I'm going to share with you something of the tone of the letter, the appeal of Christian unity, the appeal to continuity with the ancient church, and the focus upon the question of by faith alone, sola fide. First of all, the tone of the letter. The cardinal begins this letter with terms of Christian affection. 
He calls the Genevans beloved brothers in Christ. He wishes them love and peace from God the Father, from Christ the Son, and from the Holy Spirit. And repeatedly, he calls them beloved brothers and sisters. He speaks to them as brother to brother and friend to friend. Now you may have thought that calling non-Catholic Christians as brothers and sisters in Christ was a post-Vatican II development. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> it's already there. Because this is the presumption of love. This is the presumption that I'm not going to judge my brothers in a personal sense. All I'm going to do is to appeal to them, to ask them to come closer to Christ, to come to the church that Christ has founded. As I read these opening lines of the letter, I must confess I, I felt much like a son reading a letter from a kind father who is imploring his wayward son to come home. The second feature of this letter about Christian unity. The cardinal, in no uncertain terms, calls the people of Geneva back to the unity of faith and piety which they had enjoyed. Whether they think they enjoyed it or not, well, that's another thing. But he believed that they did. He speaks of how dissension and schism are offensive to a true Christian spirit. Cardinal Satellito recounts the foundations of the gospel of Christ as he weaves together biblical language and allusion into virtually every sentence of the letter. How many of you have ever spent any time reading Christian writers from the 16th century, Protestant and Catholic? You will notice that these people practically consumed the Bible. And this wasn't just Catholics or Protestants, it was both. The Bible just filled their thoughts. And when they wrote, they naturally would just make all kinds of allusions to the Bible. That's what Cardinal Santaletto does in this letter. All in the purpose of showing them that there should be nothing more distasteful to a Christian than destroying the unity of Christ's church. But that's exactly the question, you see. How do you have that unity? On what basis do you have that unity? If in my first statements about the tone, we saw that Cardinal Sadaletto has a presumption of love, in this second about Christian unity, he has a presumption of truth. It's exactly what John Paul II said in Ut Unum Sent, his letter on Christian ecumenism where John Paul says there can be no true ecumenism or unity without truth. That is what Cardinal Sadaletto is reminding the Genevans of. And so that brings us to the third point of Cardinal Sadaletto's letter. Namely, the continuity that there must be with the Christian past. There is, he expresses the horror, the horror, of introducing new doctrines into the church. Nothing should be more distasteful to a Christian than introducing something which Christ has not taught. And it is essential that that faith, which was once and for all delivered to the saints, should be passed on from generation to generation. Calvin probably would not have disagreed with that. But exactly what the content of that faith was is where their divergence occurred. The fourth element. As an illustration of a new doctrine, Cardinal Satelletto gives the question of by faith alone. Now I'm going to give you, I'm going to, as I discuss Cardinal Satelletto's uh, treatment of by faith alone, I'm going to weave in and out of quotations from his letter. He begins that section this way. He says, We strive for this good of our constant and perpetual salvation by faith in God and in Jesus Christ alone. This is Cardinal Sadaletto talking. 
But when I say by faith alone, I do not understand a mere belief or trust to the exclusion of love and our other duties as a Christian. Here, I am persuaded that all my faults are forgiven me in the cross and blood of Christ. This indeed is necessary for us, and it is our first entrance into God, perhaps an allusion to the cleansing waters of baptism. But, he says, this is not enough. Let us also, he says, apply our minds and devotion to the Most High God and have a strong desire to do the things that are pleasing to him. This is what the Holy Spirit will help us to do. This mindset, he says, even if it doesn't progress to the point of actually doing good works, will create an interior disposition within a person who wants to please God in every respect. And it will give prompt, diligent obedience to God in everything that God asks of us. By placing within us the habitus of divine righteousness. The word habitus in Latin, from which obviously we derive our word habit, is a word that in, in, in medieval theology meant a disposition by which God places within the soul. In other words, what the cardinal is saying is that true righteousness is an interior habit of our lives by which we grow day by day into the likeness of Christ. And he asked the question, what else could be signified by the term righteousness in Scripture than that it has good works in view? And doesn't Scripture say in Titus 2.14 that God sent his Son into the world to make a people acceptable for him, zealous for good works? And doesn't Ephesians 2.10 say that we were remade in Christ for good works? There's nothing new under the sun. See, they dealt with all these questions in the 16th century. So, the cardinal continues, if Christ was sent that we might be made acceptable to God as we do good works uh, that were made for us in him, then faith in God through Jesus Christ can certainly not be only trust in Christ. It must also include doing good in him. That he means in his strength, in his spirit. And so, faith is a full and rich word in sacred scripture. And it contains not only the idea of belief or trust, but also hope and diligently obeying God. It must also contain love that has been made to us, known to us, in Christ. Love is the principle and the queen of all Christian virtues. This is a creation of the Holy Spirit. Because, in fact, the Holy Spirit is love itself. Indeed, God is love. Calvin couldn't argue with that. That's right out of 1 John. God is love. And we can neither please or be acceptable to God without love. So when we say that we are saved by faith in God and Jesus Christ alone, we go on to say that love is the first of all that is included in this faith. This love is the principal cause of of our salvation. This is something that just sends Calvin into a frenzy when he says that love is the cause of our salvation. In his letter, in his reply to Cardinal Sadleto, John Calvin says that the doctrine of justification by faith is much too complex to be able to deal with sufficiently. But he does give us a synopsis or a summary of his understanding of justification by faith. And make no mistake about it, Calvin believes that this 
is the highest doctrine of religion, the doctrine of justification by faith. He agrees with Luther that the church stands or falls upon whether the doctrine of justification by faith alone, as preached by the Protestants, is true. And he goes on to tell the honored cardinal that it is only in the Roman churches where there is crass ignorance of this doctrine. Now, this dissonance between what is most important in the Christian religion, namely justification by faith, and the state of ignorance in the Roman churches agrees perfectly with Martin Luther's assessment of the Roman church. And for this reason, Calvin thinks that the Roman church has extinguished the glory of Christ. It is, is as if Calvin wrote across the Catholic church the Hebrew word Ichabod, the glory has departed. So what is the alternative? To reestablish the church on the basis of Christ and the gospel. So Calvin thinks. So, because the Roman church wanted to lend men back to slavery, now the gospel will liberate people from that tyranny. Calvin is anxious to answer Satellito's accusation that the Calvinist theology made good works unnecessary. This is extremely important because it is still true today for knowledgeable Protestant Christians. If you say to them that their theology makes doing good unimportant or unnecessary, they will respond, no, that's not true at all. They will, they will react against that because they have worked out an understanding between faith and works. And this is what Calvin wants to answer. Sadleto said that their theology leads to the logical conclusion that holy living is superfluous for a Christian. But, Calvin says, no, that is not the case at all. But, in the process, he makes a distinction which is utterly and absolutely crucial for us to understand the difference between the Catholic, that is the Roman Catholic doctrine of justification by faith and the Calvinist doctrine of justification by faith alone. In effect, Calvin says that good works have no role in our justification. Here are his words. We deny that good works have any share in our justification, but we claim full authority for them in the lives of the righteous. Here we find Calvin expressing what language of later Calvinists would say, that faith alone justifies, but faith is never alone in the one justified. Works function in a Calvinist view of salvation as evidence of true faith, but it is still the faith alone that justifies. And here we begin to understand the true nature of the differences, parenthetically. After two doctoral degrees, I amassed two master's degrees, and all kinds of study throughout my life, I finally have come to realize that half of the game is understanding what the real questions are. And incidentally, in your attempt to help separated brothers and sisters to come home to the Catholic Church, that is a crucial realization, that they have to be asking the right questions in order to see the significance of the answers. My intention today is to help you to understand a little bit better for a lot of Protestant Christians in America what the right questions are. Here's the difference. The, in the Calvinist conception of salvation, justification is an act of God's grace whereby he declares the sinner righteous without any reference to that person's works. But since God is the one who declares a man just, is also the one who changes his heart, that is regeneration, as Calvinists call it, through the work of the Holy Spirit, Calvin insists that a justified man will naturally perform good works. In short, 
Calvin defends the necessity of good works, but he separates good works from justification. And this is the crucial thing about the doctrine of justification by faith alone. For a Calvinist, as for most knowledgeable Protestants, justification is an act of God's grace, whereas sanctification is a process of God's grace. Justification is a declaration by God alone. Sanctification, or the process of becoming holier, is an absolute necessity for the justified man, but that increase in holiness doesn't add one iota to his justification. Growth in holiness and the performing of good works only proves to others and to himself that he truly has faith. It doesn't make a difference in the final justification. Well, there's two more topics I was going to talk about, but I can see time. Just to give you a two-minute two summary. The other, one of the other questions that they deal with in the letter that comes up over and over again had to do with the authority of church councils, of ancient church councils. By and large, we heard from Dr. Thigpen that Luther and Lutherans rejected the authority, the infallibility of ancient councils. Calvin, I guess the best way to characterize it would be this. Calvin believed that ancient councils were venerable but not infallible. By the way, that's not, an, that's not a view that has died out. That's still in the Catholic Church today. But by infallible, the church means that those, those dogmatic decisions of ancient councils cannot be revised, that they are part, a part of the deposit of faith. Calvin, however, thought that whenever there was a conflict, as he perceived it, between the scriptures and an ancient council, the scriptures had to win. The third topic that they deal with in the letter has to do with what is most dear to my heart, the doctrine of the Holy Eucharist. It was the transition from a Calvinist understanding of the Eucharist to a Catholic understanding that made me a Catholic. Or maybe I should say that convinced me I should become a Catholic. Then it was in fact the Eucharist itself not my thoughts about it that made me, a Eucharist, made me a Catholic. But in this issue, Calvin again is very zealous to show that his doctrine is consistent with the ancient fathers of the church. And so who does he quote? He quotes what Calvinists today even believe is the greatest of the ancient saints, St. Saint Augustine. Now, we must recognize that there are passages in the writings of St. Augustine which, if interpreted in a certain light, could lead to a Calvinist conclusion. But I became convinced, because you can see I had a lot of stake in this issue. I read St. Augustine's writings on the Eucharist, and I looked at every single passage that he dealt with. And the conclusion that I came away with was this that even though there are isolated statements here and there that might be taken to support a Calvinist belief about the Lord's Supper, when you took all of those statements into account, you had to walk away with the conclusion that his doctrine was more Catholic than Calvinist. Or to put it another way, he truly believed that Christ was present, body and blood, soul and divinity, in the Eucharist, consecrated on the altar. That is something that Calvin could never say. So where did Calvin go wrong? I had to ask myself. He went wrong in this respect. He began to look at the fathers of the church selectively. I want to repeat that. That's where people go wrong. When they read the fathers of the church selectively, where they take a quotation here and one there to prove their point. But it ignores the entire historical development that went on in the ancient church. Is this relevant today? Yesterday. No, Thursday. I turned on the History Channel. There's a program called The Rise of Christianity. The historical consultant for this program was none other than John Dominic Crossan, 
the impression that was left to the unsuspecting viewer was that the Council of Nicaea was a political victory of the Orthodox over the Arians. Or that Leo I was the first one ever to, to Leo I, by the way, in the mid fifth century, was the first one to ever assert the authority of the See of Rome all, all, over all the other sees or the other ancient bishoprics in the church. Statement after statement built upon a theory of history that is highly questionable. You can read books, and they're out there, they're public. For example, Professor Bart Ehrman from the University of North Carolina has written a book called Lost Christianities, in which he contends that Christianity in the ancient world was very diverse. Gnostics, they were, and there were these people called the Orthodox, and these others that were called by this name and that name. And these were all legitimate forms of Christianity which were suppressed in the end. Our conceptions of history influence what we think about the nature of true religion. And so it is crucial that we deal with this question. So I urge you, take this, serious hist this history seriously. But I'm going to conclude with this. To understand the true nature of Calvinism, we need to broaden our perspectives just a bit. And we need to ask ourselves the question, what is the spirit which animated Calvinism and still does today? I can give it to you in one word, iconoclasm. Calvinists are iconoclasts. Iconoclasm is the belief and practice of destroying all images of the divine. It comes from two Greek words, icon, which means image, and klao, or klan, the Greek verb that means to break or to smash. And like the iconoclasts in the Byzantine East of the 8th and 9th centuries, the Calvinists in the 16th century believed that the Roman Catholic Church had fostered and encouraged idolatry. And this was played out in actual life in the year 1575, about 11 years after Calvin died in the city of Paris on the eve of St. Bartholomew's Day. On the eve of St. Bartholomew's Day in the year 1575, Protestants entered into the Catholic churches and destroyed many, if not most, of the statues in the churches in Paris. The next day, the Catholics retaliated in what has been known as the infamous St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre. The Catholics attempted to kill as many Protestants as they could. And we studied this, of course, in seminary in Reformation history. And I remember sitting around with some of my fellow Calvinist seminarians and discussing this. They, like me, were horrified at the behavior of the Catholics who killed Protestants over the destruction of images in the churches. And while not excusing the taking of human life on the part of Catholics, I wondered out loud to my fellow seminarians what we Calvinists might do given the same times and attitudes. Had some authorities burned our Bibles or forbid our worship services? I remembered the reaction of my fellow Calvinist seminarians. No, they said. The Protestants were fully justified in destroying those images because those statues and pictures of the saints and of Christ were idolatrous. To worship those images was a clear violation of the second commandment, that is, in the Calvinist numbering of the commandments. That's the one about don't make graven images. And that response tells us something about the way a Calvinist thinks. Now, few, if any Calvinist today, would go into Catholic churches and destroy their statues. Although, to tell you the truth, I have heard from reliable sources about Catholic pastors getting up in the morning and finding statues in their churches destroyed. But this does express a sentiment that is important, that was still being advocated by Calvinists in the late 1970s. You see, a Calvinist believes that the more glory and honor you give to man, or to objects, or to created things, the less honor and glory you give to God. So a Calvinist thinks that all false images of God have to be broken and destroyed. 
And that is not only physical images, such as statues and icons, that is mental and doctrinal images as well. So to teach falsehood is idolatry for a Calvinist. Now this underlying sentiment that motive is, is what motivated Calvin's criticisms of the Catholic Church because he believed in the core of his heart that it was a false system of worship which the quote-unquote Roman party had fostered, had foisted on the people of Europe. This is what led Calvin to decry the Catholic emphasis upon works as integral to salvation. To him as to Luther, if works played an active role in our salvation, that would be detracting from the glory of God and would be honoring the human creature. To Calvin, to trust in the ancient councils of the church as having definitive authority would be to trust in man, not in God. To believe that the Logos, the eternal Son of God, confined himself to the dimensions of a communion wafer would be to limit the power and glory of Christ. In effect, the Roman system was an affront to God in Calvin's mind. Calvin believed, as do all true Calvinists derived from, that man and God are in competition for glory. If we glorify man, we are taking glory away from God. And you know what? The Calvinists are half right. You see, sinful men, affected by the scourge of concupiscence, are out to take glory away from God. We, in our own ways, believer or unbeliever, small or great, we attempt to place ourselves in the place of God. But the Calvinists are only half right. God does not see himself in competition with us. The way that God overcomes our idolatrous tendencies is to entice us into a love relationship where we no longer want to be in competition with God, but we want to be in cooperation with his grace. And so faith and works are not in competition but they're woven together in a beautiful tapestry called holiness. Those works which are decried by the Apostle Paul in his letters are actions by which we attempt to gain God's favor apart from Christ. It was these kind of works that Paul was condemning in Romans and Galatians. But that's different than works which flow from grace and faith. Those works are pleasing to God because they complete the faith that was his initial gift in the first place. These faith-filled works are a manifestation of the glory of God. And so the saint whose feast day we celebrated yesterday, St. Charles Borromeo, says in one of his homilies, better than I could ever say it. Here's what he said. God desires to save us so much that we are capable of desiring him. Excuse me. God desires to save us much more than we are capable of desiring him. But why should we content ourselves with the word desire? All his pleasure, all his joy, consists in honoring us ennobling us, exalting us, saving us, and making us happy. <laughs> now I must confess, if such words were uttered by a 20th century Catholic today, I might be justified in claiming that this person had a self-centered image of God. Because people today do think that God exists only for their happiness. But coming from a 16th century saint, who was dedicated in a selfless sacrifice to the glory of God and the good of the church. This, I have to say, derives from a profound awareness that escaped John Calvin. 
It is an awareness that in perfecting the goods of our humanity, God is glorified. It's the same message that Dr. Hahn last night spoke about with regard to Athanasius, Augustine, and Aquinas. It is what St. Irenaeus said, that, the man, that man fully alive is the glory of God. You see, man may be attempting to take glory from God, but God is not interested in taking glory from man. God wants to fill us with his glory, with his pleasure, and indeed with his very own life. And why? So that in the end, you and I, as the liturgy says, may become everlasting gifts to the Father. This is the Catholic vision, that God in his goodness is not a distant God whom we must please by faith, but he is a God who gives us his very life. And in instilling his life within our souls, we are able to make that journey of faith that consists of trust and reliance upon him, but also working that out in every step of our lives. This is the Catholic understanding of salvation. And how does God do this? Well, first of all, he reminds us that we could never do this on our own. That is salvation by grace, that we could not do it on our own. But how does he do it? He gives us the greatest grace of all, the gift of his divine life through the instrumentality of the sacraments. As a Calvinist, born, raised, educated, preaching Calvinism for almost, well, 40 years, and the last four were making the transition, I can tell you the message of the Catholic Church, the gospel of Christ, as taught in the fullness of the Catholic faith, is what the world needs. And the world is yearning for that. Let me end with an oblique reference to something that I think might be important for you to know. This past summer, I was in Canada for an academic conference. I was giving a talk on St. Augustine's view of science and religion. I happened to meet a Lutheran friend there. And we struck up a conversation. And he said to me, well, what church do you belong to? And I said, well, today I'm Catholic, but I was a Calvinist, a Presbyterian, for many, many years. And he said, whoa, well, that's quite a transition. And I said, yes, he said, I'd like to hear about that. So we had coffee one evening, and we talked together about it. But before I shared with him my story, he gave me a letter that was written by one of his fellow Lutheran ministers to the bishop of his Lutheran district. In this letter, just in the first page of seven pages, this Lutheran minister recounted the instances of ten different Lutheran theologians who have left the Lutheran church to become either Catholic or Orthodox. And after the story of each one of these theologians, and these were names that people that read theology will recognize. After each one, the man who wrote the letter said, why? 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 That is the question we want our separated brothers and sisters to ask. Why? Why has this happened in Protestantism? And is there an answer in the fullness of faith? You know, it's easy for us as Catholics, and it's easy for me as an adult convert, to sort of fall and slip into the attitude of, oh, I want people to experience, I want, or I want people to see you know, that the Catholics were right after all. Right? But as I was praying the other day in front of the Blessed Sacrament, that always has a way of humbling you. <laughs> as I was playing, praying before the Blessed Sacrament, I thought to myself, so why do I yearn so much for my brothers and sisters to come home to the Catholic Church? Let me use an example from Star Wars. As Darth Vader said to his son, you don't know the power of the Force. <laughs>
you do not know the power of the sacraments. You do not understand the divine life that is being communicated through these institutions of grace. My friend, do not keep these treasures to yourself. Share them with those around you that they may too experience what you experience every day. Not so that we can say, oh, we were right after all. That we can say, don't you see how gracious a loving God is? Don't you see how wonderful it is that a God would not only want to declare you righteous, but would want to give you his divine life in your very soul? Because that is what heaven is. And heaven begins now in that church which Christ founded that is called one, holy, Catholic, and apostolic.